So now um, you might have already noticed that there's a lot of AI talk going on today. But before we all dreamt of being served by robot butlers, um, we dreamt of exploring space. And some people still do that. For example, um, the Colorado School of Mines and Lockheed Martin, who issued the Over the Dusty Moon Challenge. And if you manage to get sponsored by TNG for that challenge, and then manage to get first, first place, third, third place, excuse me, um, you not only get to present your solution to NASA, you also get invited to the Big Tech Day to give a talk, and which is clearly the superior honor. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I will give over to Matteo and Joseph to tell us about their amazing solution. Great. <laughs> So, hello everybody. I hope you guys are not too tired from all the presentations coming in. There's still quite a long day to go. So, I hope you guys find this one interesting as well. So, basically, we are, I'm going to speak about, I'm going to give you a little bit of the context of what is like lunar exploration at the moment. What efforts are we carrying, and especially within our team that we formed in order to tackle one of the main technology gaps and challenges and risk that we have when exploring the moon, that it comes to transporting lunar soil. So, yeah, without further ado, we're going back to the moon. And actually, it is that right now, we are having one of the best times. We have like a second space race. Private companies are jumping in into the field, and they are carrying new ideas, new concepts to push forward for this reason. And it's like within NASA being the main envelope and the main organization carrying these international efforts, you have other space agencies such as ESA, JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, that are jumping in it as well to just help push this together. And we had the Artemis mission, the whole Artemis program, Artemis was the sister of Apollo, is the one that is going to be uh, carrying all these missions within the NASA scope to go back to the moon. And it has already started. We have the, that the Orion spacecraft has carried the first uh, uh, Artemis mission already, and it was an uncrewed flyby around the moon. Took place 2022 after a couple of delays. And now we have more missions coming. In 2023, 2024, we are going to have the first flyby that is going to go again back to the moon with a crewed spaceship. And then in 2025, we are going to have again people stepping on the moon. Not only that, but also we are going to have the, an equivalent to the International Space Station as we have here on Earth, but we are going to have that in the moon. That is Gateway, and it's the European Space Agency is going to play a big part in it. The carrying and developing one of the modules that is going to be there, and it's going to start being launched and built in 2024. The idea of this gateway is, as its name says, is to be a portal. A portal between Earth, lunar surface, and then also to the Moon, uh, also to Mars, sorry. So we have all this, we have the scope that the Moon is an intermediate step, an intermediate stage before we jump and we go to Mars. But you may wonder, as always, like, well, oh, also, in uh, 2030, by 2030, the idea is to have a permanent settlement of humans on the moon. Uh, as we do in some remote areas on the Earth, such as the Arctic, the idea is to have uh, basically like a laboratory with people that is permanently there by the 2030s. But yeah, but do may, you may wonder, you may see all these renders, this very fancy stuff, and you think, this costs a lot of resources, this costs a lot of money. Why should we do it then? So uh, first of all, because of scientific reasons, the moon is a time capsule, in a sense. So basically, the moon is telling us what is the past of our solar system and also how it originated, how it was created, tell us a lot of the synergy of the system between the moon and the Earth. Also, there is, uh, there is water on the moon, as you can see in the lower figure, and this water, understanding it, where it comes from, can tell us if this water is also the same source, that the one that we have on, on Earth, and this also helps us answer the final question of like, okay, where does life originate from? Because in order to understand life, we need to understand water. Where does the water come from? And also, understanding about the human body and ourselves, the, yeah, um, understanding more like working on life sciences, how does the body behave and the lower gravity for a longer uh, period of time, how does it behave, psychologically speaking, when you are in an enclosed environment for a long time on the moon, all these different aspects can help us understand better 
who we are, how we work, and that can truly benefit us back on Earth. Not only that, also technology-wise, the developing of new materials, new textiles, all this uh, technology that comes with it is going to benefit us back on Earth. Indeed, the, one of the main points of going to the moon is that we have an enclosed system. We cannot be relying on taking things from Earth and then transporting them to the moon, but we need to have a closed economy. This closed economy is very much focused on recycling, on how to make the most out of the things that we have. And for a sustainable development and for an energetic transition here on Earth, this can really benefit us and we can really learn from this idea of circular economy on the moon. Also, as I mentioned before, the whole Artemis program, the moon serves as a lab to go to Mars. You know, if we want to go to Mars, the time that it takes to go there, the launching window, they are very long times. And we make a mission to Mars, it may be, oops, it may be like a year, maybe, or months before we can contact them again or, or check how everything is working. So we need to test all of those technologies that we have here on suitable environments as the one that the moon offers before we can actually go to Mars. And for resources as well. So as I mentioned before, there is water on the moon. That's something that is uh, essential when we want to go there. But also there are like some solar wind implanted elements, such as helium-3. This isotope of helium is very useful for uh, nuclear fusion. And also there are some other metals, some other elements, such as the platinum group elements, that are very valuable here on Earth, that we don't have the access to them just as really, and they are scarce. So we need to look for them in other, in other places. So well, so now I hope I convince you all that it is important to put money on lunar exploration. So now, what problems are we facing when we are going there? And the things like the lunar environment, it is unforgiving. First of all, vacuum. There is no atmosphere. There is what is so-called exosphere, a little bit, but there is a very, very rough vacuum. This imposes a lot of limitations and constraints, either on the materials that we can use, also, if we ha want to have a crew there. We, have, uh, we need to have a pressurized habitat, a suitable atmosphere that is enclosed and that can withstand the gradient in pressure between the outside and the inside. Indeed, you see like this, this small sketch over here that is a sketch made by one of the Apollo 17 astronauts of some celestial glow that they saw at dawn. Basically, we have a tiny bit of an atmosphere, but yeah, not enough sufficient for basically operating there as normal. Also, temperature. It's a very big issue. Temperature, the moon is really cold and the moon is very warm. But also it is kind of complicated to define temperature on a vacuum state, but we're going to do so. It's a little bit of a step, but well, I hope you guys forgive me. Then the extreme temperature gradients, that means that the difference on a piece of equipment between the sunlit area and the one that is on the shadow can be up to 200 degrees difference then you can imagine the thermal stress that is going to undergo in this material. This, again, imposes some very serious constraints on what can we use, which materials are suitable for the lunar conditions. And also, we want to keep an environment. We want to keep a, a suitable room temperature, the one that we have here. Uh, we need to fight against these extreme temperature gradients and these extreme temperatures. What else? Radiation. We have no atmosphere, once again. So all the micrometeoroids also, and then cosmic rays, are impacting directly on the surface of the moon. That means that we need some protection against it. Uh, it can really be a very big hazard, either for electronics, for the materials, and also for the, uh, for the health of the crew themselves. And gravity. The gravity on the moon is one-sixth of the one that we have on Earth, which makes it very difficult to operate on the moon as you can see by my uh, fellow friends. <laughs> and then tractive forces of vehicles and everything that we move there with like an operational uh, moving purpose needs to be tested on this smaller gravity. And we need to think how is it going to perform there? Is it going to be suitable? Is it going to be good enough? That is what we want in the end. Yeah, and also, it has also its counterpart. We can, the way that we carry their structures, they can be lighter than the one that we have on Earth. So it also has its positive sides. Well, and something very terrifying, that is the lunar night. As we know, 
the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. That means that as the moon is orbiting around, you always see the same face. So lunar night takes 28 days. The lunar day at, at its whole is 28 days. So, oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> so that means that we need to overcome 14 days of darkness. Then these 14 days of darkness are very complicated because we need to have thermal control, we need to have energy, and the main source of energy that we are relying on when we are on the moon is solar energy. And we cannot just pull solar panels in the dark. So we need to either think of different ways of uh, generating electricity, such as nuclear power is one of the options, or also ways of uh, keeping and storing this big amount of energy. So yeah, but also if we think about the lunar environment, as you can see in the GIF of the guy falling all the whole time, the lunar environment is filled with one thing in particular, and that is lunar regolith. The lunar regolith, as, like, as Neil Armstrong said when he stepped out of the uh, Apollo 11 capsule, the surface is fine and powdery. I can pick it up loosely with my toes. It does adhere in fine layers like powdered charcoal to the sole and sets my boots. Basically, this lunar regolith is uh, the layer of basically smashed rocks that goes from like sizes that are like microns to big boulders and it's ubiquitous on the whole of the surface. It is everywhere. Its depth can vary. It can be up to a like, few meters down. It can also be a few uh, centimeters, depending on the terrain that we are. But yeah, it is everywhere. And it is made mostly of minerals, agglutinates, glasses, mostly silicates. That means that it is a great source for like metals and oxygen. And also, not only that, but as, as I was mentioning before, due to the vacuum and the radiation, the solar wind that is coming, this powder is uh, electrostatically charged, which means that it is very, very sticky. You can see in the, in the picture over here how it is fully sticking to the, to the boots of this uh, astronaut. And then this also links us to one of the very big problems that we have on the moon. As it can go for to very fine particles, this such fine particles just can just float all around and get stuck and get stick on everywhere. As like Alan Bean said also in the uh, 1970, as he was performing like some maneuvers on the moon, after lunar lead off, a great quantity of dust floated free within the cabin. This dust made breathing without the helmet difficult and enough particles were present in the cabin atmosphere to affect our vision. And not only that, when they were trying to brush it off to try to take it out, out of the textiles and the, and the materials that they were wearing, it would just scrub farther in, making the, just eliminating this dust very, very difficult. And also, as Eugene Cernan said, uh, one of the very big challenges of going to the moon is not that much the technological and mechanical challenges. We kind of have those covered already, but it's dealing with the lunar dust. And this lunar dust, are the particles that are smaller than 20, 20 microns, and they just fly all around. Once again, there's no atmosphere. So there is no process that erodes these particles and makes them more like the ones that we have here on Earth. So they are very sharp. They are very sharp and very angular, which makes them very abrasive. So we have this abrasive material that is floating everywhere, that it's very sticky, nasty stuff, really nasty stuff. So yes, we need to be very careful with that. If we have any, uh, any mechanical parts, any mechanical gears, and it gets stuck in there, it's going to erode the whole thing. It's going to make a really uh, problems on the geomechanical parts. And not only that, if you breathe it, it's also, it's also very bad. It's being investigated at the moment what dangers it may have, probably, but already astronauts reported the so-called lunar hay fever when they, when they had watery eyes, they were kind of having difficulties to like talk, breathe properly. But yeah. So you can see you can see here, I mean not right now, that how the oh well how like every activity that you do on the moon just creates a lot of dust. A lot of dust that we need to have into account. But yeah, but there are some there are good sides to regolith as well. It's not not everything is bad. But also as this is the only and more uh, abundant resource that we have on the on the moon is the one that we can benefit from the most. So that's why we look into the field of ISRU, or in situ resource utilization. This means that we make use of the resources that we have on any 
celestial body with the idea of reducing our dependency with Earth. If we don't need to carry that much stuff from Earth, that means that our missions have less launches, which makes them less risky, less complex, and l basically uh, cheaper. That is what we want also at the very end. And then learning how to utilize these resources, learning how to use the resources either on the moon or in other bodies, also teaches us on this whole idea of circular economy, how to reduce waste, how to make the use of the most that we have that is greatly benefiting for us here on Earth. So yeah, so what can we use regolith for in the on the moon? So as I said before, it has a lot of oxygen. What do we need oxygen for? For breathing. So for life support, it is essential. Not only the for that, but also if we want uh, oxidizer, that is like a form of the, it's needed for propellant, we can also extract it from this, from this oxygen. There is also water on the moon. In the permanently shadowed craters, in the poles of the moon, that is also where it is most likely that we are going to have a settlement, um, there is iced water. And this water we can use for life support, once again, for breathing, and we can use as well for energy and for propellant. So you can think of the moon as a like gas station in which you can go get yourself like a bottle of water, also repose the spacecraft and then continue the journey. So yeah, but also for construction and infrastructure. You can see this picture over here, these are some of the samples that I was working on while I was uh, still uh, at ESA. And it goes around uh, using lunar regolith simulant to create bricks for building infrastructure. And also, uh, I needed to also make a mention, there is a, here at UM, there is one group that is working that is called the War Exploration, in which I was also taking part a couple of years ago. That the idea is to have in a rover that focuses the light coming from the sun into like spot on the ground to create pathways and also uh, landing pads. The whole idea of that, as we were speaking before about the, the regolith and the dust, is that if we create these landing areas, we can mitigate a little bit of the dust that is generated when we land there. And that is very, very key. And also, more exotic stuff, like solar cells and much more. I think this is crazy. You can just get some sand, and then out of the blue, you have a solar cell. I think that's, I think that's crazy. It is indeed the, this group over here in 2022 is already uh, carrying research on how to do so, and they were proposing some of the minerals that are there present on the moon that can be treated to already create solar cells in situ from there without relying on ma many more resources on Earth. I think that's, I think that's crazy. <laughs> and yeah. But also, uh, around here in the team that we are part in, we are tackling all these uh, challenges that lunar exploration poses, in particular the one of in situ resource utilization. And that is our initiative of the Spaceship ESC. That is a, a lab, an initiative created in ESA, in the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, in Germany, that whose idea was to try to function as a skunk work with projects, with students, with a creative uh, ideas, with innovative solutions on how to push forward on lunar exploration and low Earth orbit exploration. And well, the topics that we're covering were very varied from additive manufacturing through the printing with, uh, with regolith, uh, also for energy, to survive the lunar night, many other issues. I even have here a small Lego man without an arm and without a head. That it, this was 3D printed with lunar regolith, uh, lunar regolith simulant. So if you are interested, you can just come back to me and I can show you better. But there is one more problem to it. We are thinking about how to use lunar regolith, and as you can see, I was speaking about that the whole time, but what we don't know that much is how to transport it. The lunar environment is very difficult, and the lunar regolith, as it is sticky, as it is uh, abrasive, is very difficult to move around. So we decided to, within this initiative, create our own group uh, at the spaceship. And this group, the idea is to try to tackle this issue and try to tackle this challenge of how do we convey, how do we move uh, lunar regolith, because we may have a quarry, we may have a mine, and then we may have the oxygen extraction plant 50 meters away uh, from it. How do we cover this distance? It's a very crucial issue in the end, and there is a big technology gap, technology gap in that. So this is the, the team that we formed. It is a very international team. It is a, also a multidisciplinary team. 
Um, for example, myself, I'm a physicist, I'm also aerospace engineering, most of the people we have material scientists, and from different perspectives, from different ideas, we were tackling the different issues on building an actual system that was working for this sole reason. As you can see, we are also quite scattered a little bit around. So we have two people from Spain, uh, two Italians, three French, one Irish guy, one German, and all of us were based in Cologne in Germany. If you wonder what that blue dot there is, me editing this presentation in the Netherlands, explaining this is in, custo in customs before entering the US was a huge match, mess, but we, we managed. And with that, I'll head the presentation to my colleague Joseph, who is going to speak to you about the, what the challenge was, what our solution was. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, does it work well? Oh, looks like it. So, guten tag everyone. Uh, I'm Joseph and I will be your host for the rest of this presentation. So, uh, my goal here is going to explain what is this challenge, what was our solution, why we think it's worth um, being kept for further explorations, um, and finally telling you how the competition went. Um, so, to start with uh, basic requirements uh, and basic background, Over the Dusty Moon Challenge is a competition funded by the Colorado School of Mine in Golden, Colorado and Lockheed Martin in cooperation with some NASA people. Um, so the main idea is to convey regolith simulant over 5 meter horizontally and 2.5 meter vertically. But not only that, they decided to make the thing a bit more tricky this year and so they added rocks inside the simulant that we were asked to sieve. Um, with that, we also needed to um, reach some mass flow, so at least one ton a day, uh, and think about dust mitigation and safety measures, like having an emergency button to uh, switch off the current or uh, also make the, uh, the whole thing safe to operate, like in terms of mechanical uh, danger. So that's for the basic ones, but we had also some special requirements because we were working for over the Dusty Moon Challenge as we wanted to win the competition. But we were also part of the Spaceship EAC team that tried to develop its own uh, conveying system for regolith. So obviously, uh, you had the high mass flow um, that we wanted to achieve but also low electrical consumption. So for each watts that we would use, we were like discarded some points and that's how we were judged in the end. Um, we also needed to have a lightweight uh, system because like you're gonna have to ship it to the moon. And so for each kilograms you had, uh, you were also uh, discarded some points. But now for Spaceship EAC, so they didn't have the same objective, let's say. So they used this, challenge as, um, as a way to set the basis for regular transport activities at EAC. So it means that we designed the thing to work on the moon more than to uh, win the challenge, even though we tried our best to have both uh, objectives met. Uh, we also needed to have it good looking as it will be exhibited uh, at EAC in one of the lunar facilities that, that they are uh, building at the moment. All right, so with all of that, uh, let's delve into the challenge. So uh, we heard about this challenge around September uh, 2022 and started to think about uh, like the early stages designs. Um, so that's where we tested our prototypes and went for one design. Uh, then wrote the report re and submitted it. We were approved for the phase two, the January 23rd, so you can imagine we were like very happy. It's already great to go to Colorado. But anyway, after that started the real part of the challenge, the phase two. So obviously you had the design of the real uh, device, then the bill of material, the procurement, and the shipment. And the shipment to the United States, when you don't know how to do it, it's something. <laughs> Um, so it was uh, planned to be on around May, but as you can uh, imagine, uh, when you procure things, uh, it takes a bit of time to come. Uh, so it was more about like the end of May, uh, and then everything arrived on time, and we could do the competition in the end. So this is a render of our system, of how it would look like on the moon. 
So you have uh, an horizontal system like that. Like we actually have two because uh, it is made to be modular, so you can have like plenty of them that uh, converge uh, on the vertical system. And here you have the hopper uh, that looks really like the one that we saw at the competition, and here uh, the vertical system that I'm that is the one that uh, I'm going to spend time explaining today. So the vertical system. So you have another render here, um, which is the one we we based our, uh, our building on. So it's, it is uh, an Archimedes screw, but inverted. So for those that don't know, an Archimedes screw, it's like a big screw with big threads and that you rotate them. Uh, you can see that uh, over there. We 3D printed it in the end, because like, it was not easy. So I'm going to pass those to the people on the crowd so you can just see the work of uh, a student team. Um, yeah, but this one is special because, like, it's not the screw that rotates; it's the tube. Um, and by rotating, you have scoops on the bottom part that will shovel the material, the granular material, inside. And then, with the friction of the tube, it will go through the threads and go upwards. All right. So, yeah, obviously, um, you have the ball bearings and motors. But important thing is that this system is modular. So you can have it in sections, and you can make it like 2.5 meters, 3, 2, 1, whatever you want. So this is one render of the, the system sections with the clamps to connect the tubes, with the ball bearings, etc. All right, so how did we get to this point? So this is the early stage part of the challenge, where we, we were sure that we wanted some kind of screw, but we didn't really know the shape of this screw uh, or even the parameters. So you can see here GIFs of us testing things like uh, the vacancy between the, the, the screw and the tube, or here testing the, the threads spacing. So by the way, this is the first time that we saw some sand going uh, upwards of one of our um, devices, so that was also a, a great moment. Um, some rejected designs included things like uh, gluing the threads to the to the tube, so it works, but only a little bit. So uh, not great for us. Or just gluing the the whole screw th to the tube. So spoiler, it doesn't work at all. So um, after this work of early stage design, um, we had to um, give a report to the CSM, and what was in the report was this prototype uh, with all the tests that we could do with it. So it included things like uh, power requirement, so that we can upscale in the end, mass flow analysis for the same reasons. Um, and there's a funny story about this scale-up prediction. So we decided to take a model to scale up this, um, this device, and so we took the one of a pump. But as you can imagine, it's, it will not be correct, because first, uh, it's a model, and second thing, it's not a pump. Um, however, uh, we, it gave us the opportunity to pick one size of tube so that we, we would build around it. Um, fortunately, the prediction was wrong. We did six times uh, the expected mass flow. So that's a, that's a cool feature. Um, <laughs> So in, in this report, we also had the choice of materials. That was a big part, because like, you have to convince people that your device can go on the moon. So as my colleague said, like, there is outguessing. There is like, thermal expansions and, and stuff. We also had the luck to have a, an IoT expert on the team. So uh, Internet of Things, maybe you're more familiar with it than I am. Um, but I will talk a bit more about it later. And then a regolith coating, because we had three material engineers, so we needed to do material science as well. And I will explain it just a little bit later. So for the vertical system, I, I'm going to explain to you how it works and how the friction coefficient is the key parameter to this device. So there is only one existing published article on this device, and this is um, about conveying food, like soybeans, uh, wheat, etc. 
So um, what this graph tells us is that your friction coefficient, okay, first thing, the friction coefficient is like a coefficient that tells you how hard uh, it is to make something slide over something else. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so what this graph tells you is that if you increase the friction coefficient at first, you will increase your mass flow, which is a great thing. So you can imagine that as you have the friction carrying your compact matter, but if the friction is not uh, high enough, you will have the matter sliding, and so you will lose efficiency. But what happens with soybeans is that your friction coefficient decreases a little bit because your matter cannot reorganize, and so it lets vacancies. So you have still a higher speed of conveyed material, but the material you convey has a, lo has a lesser volumic mass. However, for regolith that has a continuous grain size repartition, um, it is not a problem, as even though you can have those kind of vacancies created by the friction coefficient, you can feel those with the smaller particles. So we decided to go for it and to increase the friction coefficient as much as we could so that we would have a better uh, outcome in the end. Um, one thing also, we said that um, abrasion was a problem with regolith. So we witnessed that during the early stage tests. And that is one of the reasons that motivated us um, creating a coating for this uh, device. So you're, you can see on the middle two uh, stainless steel sheets, coupons that were coated with our secret recipe that I will not give you today because I'm, I'm kind of working on it still. Um, or you can see that it can even coat some um, irregular shapes like a tube, for example. And for a small lab like us, it's already something. Um, yeah, so the question is, how does this coating deal with abrasion and friction. It's like, so here comes some testing. So it is some testing that I did. Um, it may need some other testing to be more like publishable. However, it gave us, it gave us already all the information that we needed to know that it was a good idea. So um, you have the, the blue curve here that represents the coated coupon and the orange one that represents the raw coupon here. So what you can see is that, yeah, at time zero of abrasion, because this is an abrasion, uh, like you put your sample in an abrasion machine and you wait, and depending on the time, you can see the friction coefficient. So you can see is that at the beginning, yes, your coated part has a bigger friction coefficient. So woohoo, we win. But um, with time passing by, you can see that this friction coefficient decreases and it's normal because like you're abrading something that is really rough, so you make it more smooth. Um, however, the coating resisted six hours, so and on some bars of pressure, so uh, let's say that in our device, the pressure will be lesser, most probably. Uh, but one other information that is important to take into account is that the raw material is, yes, has a lesser uh, friction coefficient, but with abrasion, it makes the surface rougher. So it increases the whole efficiency of your system, which is a, a very good side effect of the abrasion, which is another uh, point that tells us that it's a good idea to use this device. So yeah. Uh, now, passing back to the sieving system. So if you remember, I told you that we were asked to sieve the rocks. So you can see on these GIFs on the left that um, we used the centrifugal effect to expel the rocks. So yeah, we were thinking, we already have a tube that rotates. Why not using? Like, uh, it's saving money, saving efficiency. Um, and this is the, a picture from the competition, and you can see like a pile of rocks. Uh, so the aftermath of the competition, if you will. Um, yeah. So we can add some precision. Is that um, sieving is really difficult. Sieving regolith is currently being studied. Like you have PhDs going on about how to sieve regolith on the moon because this thing is really abrasive. It sticks to everything. So. Um, Probably it would need some uh, 
adjustment of the settings to make it work on the moon. However, it has the, it, the advantage of maybe crushing the clumps. Like if you have like balls of uh, glued regolith, then uh, if you give them a good slap, maybe they can just shatter and uh, pass the sieve. All right. So I did not focus on the horizontal system because this is an already, let's say, reviewed and reviewed process. Uh, and the organizer of the competition already said that he would consider this as to be a good device for the moon. So, yeah. Basically, in mining technology, it is uh, used pretty much everywhere uh, to convey heavy materials. So our um, horizontal system looked like this at the beginning, but looked a bit more like this at the end. You will see with the pictures. Yeah. So about the IoT part, the question we wanted to ask to answer um, was how to show the judges that we did fulfill the requirement. So for that, we installed a set of sensors, like a dust sensor that would tell us if we were creating dust by moving the matter. Uh, mass flow measurements, it it's basically a scale. Uh, rock detection system that is, that is working on um, AI, I think. It's not my field, I have to say. Um, and so in the end, it would allow us not to touch the device during the competition. Because if you do, you lose points. Um, and also, one cool feature of that is you can synchronize the speed of the horizontal and the vertical so that the bucket does not overload and also you have a nice and steady flow. All right. So to conclude on, is it fit for the moon? Um, just a little bit of theory on um, flowing behavior of granular matter. Um, when regolith flows on the moon, it charges itself. So I've put a, a picture of a balloon in here, so you can see like the electrostatic effect. Well, we, cause that we call that triboelectric charging. So you can imagine regolith as uh, 99 air balloons uh, that would charge themselves while flowing. Um, but those balloons would be like extremely sharp and extremely hard. All right. Um, so, one cool thing about our system is that it does not allow the flow to happen inside the system. It jams the granular matter. So, uh, jamming, you can see here a GIF about um, what is jamming. Jamming is when you pass from a liquid state, liquid-ish state, to a solid state in granular matter. So, here you see it flows and boom, it stops. So, what happens in our system is that you convey the whole granular matter, and then it creates a solid, and you convey it as a solid to, till the, the end of the process. So it does not charge itself, or at least way less. Uh, another very good point about our system is that, well, um, even if you abrade the surface, we saw that it would benefit the flow. So in any case, you would abrade surfaces, but in this particular process, it would make it like more efficient. So those are the two main points that make us think this is a good idea to be used on, on the moon. So now let's talk about the competition in itself. So I present you the winners of the competition, Space Team AGH. Uh, they are a Polish group, and they conveyed 60 kilograms in total. So what was cool and interesting about their their uh, system is that they used buckets. So just imagine something very classy that you have to bring on the moon and boom, you use just buckets that are conveyed with a, with a chain. Um, and actually it works. It works because like, uh, their system was really good at uh, passing the, the regulate from the horizontal system to the vertical one. Now the second team, uh, the Aussie Knots. So an Australian team, uh, that won the second place by conveying 20 kilograms. So what was amazing with their system is that their system weighed 20 kilograms. So they won all the points on this. Um, but it, it broke at the end. And you can see that uh, the dust mitigation is not really a problem for them. And you can imagine that that day we had such a wind. 
that we were like all breathing this filthy regolith. That was uh, that's still a, I'm still dreaming about about it. Um, so the fifth place belongs to the rock hoppers. So uh, this is the local team uh, of the Colorado School of Mines. And unfortunately for them, their, their system broke to like starting the first second of the challenge. So they had basically a chain and a pad attached to the chain that would just push the regolith. Um, I mean, this would abrade a lot, uh, and this is a pain to uh, make it work anyway. So the fourth place, the moon experts from RWTH Aachen, uh, they conveyed two kilograms, and they had a very interesting system about vibration. So you make the thing vibrate, and it conveys the regolith upwards. And it also should filter everything, but they were not able to uh, display this feature of their system. Um, yeah, and finally us. So Spaceship EAC team, we did 60 kilograms uh, and had the third place. Uh, we did 60 kilograms in total. I'm not talking about mass flows today, because like it's a, well, we did 240 kilograms an hour, but this is an another thing. Um, so yeah, you can see the system pouring and pouring here uh, during the competition. Here are IoT technician uh, installing his sensors, and there uh, people working on the mighty uh, or vertical system. All right. So I think it's the end of the of this presentation, and I want to thank you all for uh, like staying with us, and also thank you TNG for sponsoring us. Uh, I mean that was an amazing experience. So yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Okay, questions. One over here. So thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the um, fact that you mentioned uh, this regolith is very abrasive, and you also said that um, it attacks the metal. How does it behave with um, ball bearings and the mechanics that make your system, or like in general, any system on, mo on the moon move, right? like ball bearings and mechanics and gears? That's a very good question. Uh, so. You want to ask? You want to answer? Okay. Um, so the design we we went for an Archimedes screw because it conveys all the all the material that you're supposed not to touch inside them. So the this design has all the ball bearings on the outside of the system. So there's never a direct contact between the abrasive material and the parts that are uh, susceptible to it. So at, at the end, like, um, like the industrial or commercial versions you can see of this machine, they are um, they have a special covers to cover the ball bearings. And again, because the material is flowing separately 100% from the ball bearings, you don't have these issues. Yeah. The only problem you could have is like the link between the vertical system and the final hopper. Uh, but like this is not our problem, because like this is the CSM's problem. Uh, yeah, we did some skirts in uh, PLA, 3D printed, so that uh, the regulate wouldn't fall in the ball bearings. Safety measures. Okay, any, there is another question that was first. So, um, kind of related to the topic of durability, um, is the durability also factored in into the competition? So if the if the ball bearings, for example, if have a mm -hmm. durability rating of I don't know how many thousand hours, or the rest of the components as well, they're more durable, less durable. Mm. Yeah. So it it wasn't factored within the competition. We had one hour of trial time that we needed to do. So during this hour, durability wasn't really an issue. But as we were looking into a system that was then also usable for the, at the European Astronaut Center for Space BSC, we were looking into something that was also, that could perform and could be there for like yeah, a longer extended period of time. So yeah, but durability, the thing also, if we again put ourselves in the moon, 
putting the money to get like the materials that would be really suitable for that and that would really be doable for the amount of operations that are required would be something that then it will be required. This you can picture this more as a proof of concept rather than the the yeah, putting this whole thing on the moon with the, the materials that we have. Okay. Um, over there was in the round before I guess. Uh, so you built this inverse Archimedes screw. Um, I, I think the regular Archimedes screw is like at an angle. Would that not have also worked? Have you, uh, like did, did you try this idea first and then uh, switch to the other one? Yeah, actually doing the first edition of the challenge, the, well actually, so the people online can see me. <laughs> The, during the first uh, edition of the challenge, last year, the winning team was an Archimedes screw with an angle that would directly convey the whole thing all the way up. But then we decided to make our system different in two ways. First, creating a central node in which we could have several, several horizontal systems fed in a central bucket, and then that conveying the thing upwards. And when you want to make an upwards uh, transport regolith, a regular Archimedes screw doesn't work. That well, because you need the with this inverted accumulator screw, we are all the time with the shovels jumping, pumping the regolith inside. Without with a normal accumulator screw, we wouldn't have this uh, feature. The, maybe there would be some other exotic way to add it, but not really fulfilling the purposes that we were looking for. Yeah. Ura. The idea of using an Archimedes, uh, this system is because an Archimedes screw fills 30% of the transport volume and uh, this old man screw fills 100% of the tube. <laughs> okay, I guess we have time for one more. Uh, it's a short one anyway. Uh, the, I am given that the screw looks like a fairly simple element, why didn't you create it in a subtractive mes the method, so just cut it from a precursor, but uh, uh, created it by, by 3D printing? Uh, actually, we had some, some of the sponsors that we were collaborating with. One of them specializes on, on these old elevator, these screws, but more for uh, purposes on the, yeah, basically on, on business and so on. So then we were getting the screw for them delivered, and then it didn't make it on time. So we needed to basically improvise something real quick. From the testing that we were performing before, we had the, our own 3D printed uh, screw done, and the end that is the one that we decided to go with for the competition. And actually, it performed very well. Some of the parts were a little bit uh, eroded by the end of the competition, but it worked like a charm. Yeah, and I have to say as well that the one that we ordered functioned kind of the same way. Like It's just that it was not 3D printed, mm -hmm. it was injection. Uh, but it's still, in the end, you had a central shaft, and you could like slide the shaft inside the the pieces. Okay. Um, with that, I thank you for the talk. It was an amazing talk. <laughs> thank you. And. Thank you. Thank you.